Hey guys, Eddie here, and so far we have covered aspect ratio, different types of resolutions, and color models in part one of this two part series. In case you haven't watched it, the link will appear in the top right corner just about now. All of these apply to static images, so let's swell things up a bit and see how computers show changing graphics on display. And we start by analyzing refresh rate. The term refresh rate was invented right during the CRT monitor times, which, if you must know, have pixels laced with phosphorus, which illuminate if an electron gun fires electrons at it. It shines for a while, showing its full intensity, but fades quickly thereafter unless again hit by electrons. Since the problem is shared by every pixel, the TV or monitor has to illuminate every pixel again before it fades to keep a crisp image on screen. This happens to every pixel on screen, where electron beam traverses from top left to bottom right, line by line, hitting every pixel. The refresh rate in its simplest form is a number referring to the frequency at which this refresh needs to happen per second. That is how many times green is fully refreshed per second. Refresh rate plays a critically important role in providing a perception of smoothness of motion on the screen. Low refresh rate is associated with jerky graphics, a good acceptable refresh rate used as a default in most operating systems is 60 Hz, or capability to refresh the screen 60 times a second. However, the screens of today are capable of much higher refresh rates, like hundreds, 200s, or even 300 times a second. LCD displays used in phones, screens, and TV in modern times do not have the same issues associated with phosphorus-laced CRT monitors. Here, pixels would remain bright until they have power, and the screens can refresh the entire screen in one go. Here the term essentially means the capability of device to refresh an image on the screen from its frame buffer or memory. An associated problem of screen tier or flickering does exist to this day. The reason simply is monitor is reading and displaying image of frame from memory and showing on screen. If you fully or partially update this image by copying data to the area of memory and during your copy operation, the monitor refresh rate kicks in and it displays contents of the buffer on the screen user would see intermediate graphics showing on screen causing flickering or screen tear. There are several ways to handle this. In CRT worlds, computers utilized a blanking period between end of writing a frame and preparing to writing the next frame or image to perform the copy operations. It was a hardware limitation of CRT, but provided room for software to prepare the next frame to display without glitches. And that interval was called V-blank, vertical blanking period of V-blank. In modern times, a technique called double buffering fixes the issue by using not one, but two display buffers. In one technique, software updates frame in a frame buffer called back frame, and when it is ready and copy operation is done, its contents are copied to the active or front buffer in RAM during the refresh rate interval. This avoids glitches. Another even better technique uses two display buffers, both of which can display data. The next frame is always written to the buffer not being displayed on the on screen or not the active buffer. Once copy is complete, it becomes the active buffer and previously active buffer becomes the writable buffer. The technique called page flipping almost entirely fixes the flickering and screen tear at cost of additional memory. For smooth motion, the graphics adopter must write next frame quickly to utilize the refresh rate capability properly. To keep things in perspective, a human visual system can process 10 to 12 images per second and perceive them individually. Higher rates are perceived as motion. Motion pictures are usually captured and shown at 24 frames per second. TV is standardized as 30 frames per second or FPS, as fast changing stuff like sports benefit from higher FPS. High frame rates are typically used by fast moving graphics like video games. And hence, with this definition, we must also learn about frame rate or frames per second. Oh god, you must be sick of new terminology by now, but please don't lose hope as we are getting there. Well, simply put, the device itself can refresh the image on screen, refresh times a second. Frame rate is the frequency of frames per second at which consecutive images of frames are captured or provided to a screen to be displayed. But even on slow moving interfaces like a web page, Frames per second still has its role. Animations and scrolling on today's machines are fast moving operations. If you use social media, you are accustomed to smooth movement of page as you scroll. This is dictated by carefully timing the processing required to remain confined to the golden 16 milliseconds, which ensures a 60 frame per second frame rate, which is a de facto standard frame rate to ensure a natural feel. 
So many terminologies and factors involved in just putting a picture on screen, right? But isn't showing a natural object full of so many conflicting layers then? If you have this question in your mind, that's why this video even exists. To give you a sense of what kind of processing is required when display is involved, let's take a break from motion and talk about display adopters. Another term, seriously, well, my sincere apologies, but one can't know about display without knowing about display adopters. So display adopters, commonly known as a video graphics card, helps a computer to show an image on the screen. How much effort goes into it? Let's take an example of a very basic resolution like 1024 cross 768, which translates to 786,432 pixels. Since each pixel can have 24 or 32 bit color information associated with it, the total memory required by this image translates to 786,432 multiplied by 32, which comes to be around 3 megabytes. Note, 1024 x 768 is an antiquated resolution, but it is enough to get the point home. 3 MB is a fairly large size to put a single image on the screen, but nothing the processor can't handle. Well, as it turns out, putting a single image on screen is a pretty involved process as mismatch after mismatch exists. If you see the life cycle of an image, it is rarely stored at the maximum captured resolution, so it has to be scaled down or at least compressed, otherwise you would run out of memory pretty soon. JPEG, GIF, PNG are all compressed formats and processing is required to compress and decompress it in order to bring it to the metrics of grid from in memory. Then say you are using it in your web page and you specify your own height and width. The image would need to be scaled up or down to fit your specified height and width. Then your entire web page is in a way rendered as HTML is just telling it, I need to show an, say, an input box after the image. But the browser needs to put some tentative pixels on the screen that combine to take shape of an input box. Good enough. But your monitor display resolution and aspect ratio is hardly the same as the image we started with. So another transformation is required. And then let's say the user drags your browser window across the screen or simply resizes it. I'm feeling too lazy to check right now, but there used to be an optimization setting in Windows operating system to disable resize animation, which shows you the browser screen inflating to occupy the display screen if you click the maximize button though rarely required with modern equipment, but gives you an idea of how heavy that simple operation is, that operating system is giving you a performance-related option. All of these scale up, scale down, transform, etc. are heavy operations that take a lot of metrics multiplication and other operations and hence processing power, which leaves little processor capacity left for the actual useful work you are trying to do. And we haven't yet reached the point of playing a video or video games, which is an absolute game changer in processing requirements. Early gaming consoles used highly pixelated content to keep the game manageable by limits of hardware. To fix the problem of any graphics intensive operation taking all the processing power of your computer, graphics adapters were introduced. They were dedicated graphic processors with their own dedicated memory and processor to handle graphics operations. Color graphics adapter or CGA from IBM was the first graphics adapter or graphics card which made color graphics possible. And it used to support only two 160 by 100 in 16 colors or 320 by 200 in four colors resolutions. Irrespective of what resolution your image is and what resolution is supported by your display monitor on screen, graphics adopters had their own limits of what processing they can handle. So just like we saw in the refresh rate versus FPS debate, display adopters had to enforce their own resolution, color depth, etc., known as display mode. You can see the two display modes for CGA in action in the pictures on the screen. Modern operating systems can tune the display adopter mode after detecting the screen capabilities. Note there is also a bunch of work involved in syncing the graphics card FPS and refresh rate as the frames per second of graphics adopter must be lower than refresh rate of the screen, and frame buffer must be updated before next paint, otherwise monitor would just show halfway written frame in its buffer on the screen, resulting in something called screen tearing. Similar to issues caused by disparity between refresh rate and frames per second, there's another concept called pixel density. 
see your display screen and display adopter can be running on different resolutions, trying to show you an image which may be scaled up or down from its intrinsic or native resolution. Okay, this is getting crazy. So let's stick when, with screen versus display mode of adopter having two different resolutions. Now, if you set your display adopter to a low resolution, say 1024 cross 768, while your screen supports full HD 1920 cross 1020 resolution, now how would your display adopter show a full screen image on that screen? Because the screen is much bigger than the resolution it's trying to show. Well, there are only two options to show a scaled up or down image on the screen, cropping or scaling. Cropping is used uh, to display on a screen with low resolution, but it might not be an option as the aspect ratio might not allow that to happen or result in important bits of image missing altogether. So generally, scale is used to show an image on the screen. Say you are displaying a web page and have an image marked 100% wide and 100% high in the styling and user maximizes the browser. Now there are less pixels to display in a screen with many more pixels since the image is small in size compared to big screen we are about to show it on. It does so by adding more space between consecutive pixels of the image. The result would be kind of a blurry pixelated image being shown and here is where pixel density comes into play. Pixel density is a ratio between a screen size and its resolution. It's measured in units of pixels per inch or PPI for short. So it's a ratio of abstract resolution of the image and physical screen size. As a general rule, the lower the PPI, the more blurred or pixelated an image is. And conversely, higher PPI ensures a higher quality image with fine details and sharper text. Viewing distance also matters in image quality jargon, so it's a combination of multiple factors resulting in a good display experience. If you are a developer, viewing distance and screen type is beyond your control. But since quality user experience is a big deal, there are options available to detect PPI and mitigate accordingly. For web development perspective, we shall look at such options in our responsive images video. The last and final but a critical concept would be screen orientation which is whether your screen is wide side up or narrow side up, or in other terms, held horizontal or vertical, rotated, or in landscape mode or portrait mode. There are so many terms for screen orientation. If you use a smartphone, you must be aware of the landscape and portrait mode, say while taking pictures, and would also be aware that trying to see a picture taken in one orientation and seeing them with phone rotated in another orientation does not result in a good viewing experience. Screen orientation causes all sort of headaches for developers. In our widescreen world, the width is a whooping 1.6 times the height. To give a concrete example, let's say you are showing an animation of Earth spinning around its axis, and you have developed your web page for portrait mode of 1080p or uh, 1920x1080p uh, resolution. And your animation GIF is just a 1080 by 1080 square with a display style of 100% width and 100% height. Everything looks great until user turns the phone sideways and switches to landscape mode. Suddenly your round earth is no longer round. It is 1.6 time wider than its height. Not something you expected a square image to do, but with 100% width and height, this had to happen. Well, earth actually is not round it's an ellipse anyway, but that ellipse means a very slight distortion, uh, technically not a perfect sphere, not 1.6 times wider than high. And imagine if your animation was already showing an ellipse shape, now you have a flat earth in landscape mode, which depending on which philosophy the user subscribed to would either make him very happy or very upset. Well, that example got the point home, I believe, but there are more practical implications in everyday use. Images are worse affected when you would have flattened or elongated faces or at bare minimum and sticking to technical terms, you would definitely experience a loss of pixel density in landscape mode if your site was designed for portrait only. The converse is also true, that is if you designed your site to have say a banner in the middle and menus and links on the side and the user flips to portrait mode, the content on site would start appearing above the image and image banner might get cropped or something. 
In short, all kind of trouble if you didn't take orientation into consideration during design phase. Since this is so common a problem, there are a lot of ways to mitigate such issues, but they require extra work and approaches. We shall cover them later on in our channel, which you better subscribe to right now. Right, that concludes our coverage of display related stuff. Hope you found it informative. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. See you in next one. Goodbye.